Hi, everybody. For those of you that are Fest 2, welcomed. My name is Kitty Boone. I welcome you to the Aspen Ideas Festival. Um, just a quick note, uh, this is uh, a session right before a major picnic for all of you, which will start serving at 1245, all around the Aspen Music Tent. Uh, we have a different afternoon planned, which will be lots of fun. Um, it starts at 3, the doors open to the tent at 2 o'clock. So you have plenty of time to meet and eat and have a great time with colleagues and meet new people. Um, and we'll see you in the tent at, um, after 2. Um, right now, just quickly, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, two remarkable individuals in the world of journalism. And I will say over the last several days across the strand of conversations about freedom of speech, we've really had some fascinating discussions about social media, trust in the media, uh, algorithms and news, um, and what's happening to the state of journalism. Uh, there's Reward. another panel on that yes, this evening with, some, with Brian as well as some other journalists talking about what it's like to be a journalist today. But without any further ado, let's talk to one of the major journalists uh, in our society, the editor of the Washington Post, Marty Barron, and his interviewer, Brian Stelter from CNN. Thank you so much Thank for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a live edition of Reliable Sources, uh, <laughs> except uh, on, on Wednesday instead of Sunday. And uh, Marty, I'm thrilled to have a chance to talk with you in depth about, about the news business and about the Post. You've been there a little while now. Uh, I think we're at five years? Five and a half years. Yeah. Five and a half years, and Jeff Bezos purchasing the Post uh, almost five years at this point. Uh, so let's talk about the, the past and the present and the future of the Post. Uh, but I'd like to start with, um, if you don't mind, a hardball, uh, because I, it's something that's been on my mind in recent days. Um, and I think it's on the mind of many people that are at this festival. You know, from your perch, running the Washington Post, observing President Trump, and having to cover this story every day, is this a form of a national emergency? Are we living through a national emergency? And if so, how in the heck should journalists be covering it that way? I think it's for others to decide what, whether you classify this as a national emergency or not. That's not really my place. I, I know what our place is, and that is to cover very aggressively this administration as we would cover any other administration. I mean, the fundamental so don't role... don't cover it any differently, is what you're saying. We cover it, we cover it aggressively. Look, we're inspired by uh, the principles that, that I face every day when I walk into our newsroom, which is to, it says, the first one is tell the truth as nearly as the truth may be ascertained. Uh, and that means that uh, that's a process of striving. Uh, the truth can be elusive, uh, but that there is a truth. Uh, there are facts. It's not just a matter of somebody's personal opinion. It's not just a matter of who has the biggest megaphone. It's not just a matter of who has the most power. Uh, and so that's our job, and we understand that very clearly. We're not in the business of sort of characterizing the era. That's, we'll leave that for the opinion columnists to do. But from the news side, which is the area that I'm responsible for, it's just go out every day and find out what the facts are. Do you and your reporters feel that the truth is under assault? in a way that it wasn't a couple of years ago? Well, I think the truth is under assault from a lot of different ends, uh, and including the White House, by the way. Uh, and that is, uh, that's really concerning. Uh, there have been a lot of false statements. Uh, we actually keep a count with our fact checker, and I don't know exactly what we're number, we're number on right now, but it's- 3,000 plus. 3, 000, it's definitely 3,000 plus. I think it's well over 3,000 at this point, uh, and maybe increasing at an accelerating rate, it appears, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, that's concerning. But it's not only the administration, it's coming from other sources as well. And, um, and I think the truth is, is being undermined. Uh, there seems to be a deliberate effort to, deliberate effort to uh, uh, subvert the role of, particularly of the media, as an independent arbiter of fact. But not just the media, by the way. Uh, universities and uh, the courts, uh, the intelligence agencies, uh, all of them, scientists. Uh, and to argue that there really is no independent arbiter of, of truth. Uh, except for the administration. And Charles Krauthammer, in what ended up being his final column uh, before uh, passing away this month, he wrote last August that the institutions are holding. Uh, this was his final Washington Post column. He said, so far the signs are the institutions are holding, the guardrails of democracy are holding. Is that your perspective, uh, looking at this now almost a year later? For the most part, they're holding. I think they're showing signs of strength, but also some signs of weakness. Um, and uh, I'm, concerned, I'm concerned about that. 
I do believe that from the standpoint of, the, of most of the press, uh, we're doing our job the way that uh, the founders imagined us doing our jobs. You know, when James Madison talked about uh, the First Amendment, he talked about uh, examining public characters and measures. Uh, and that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do, uh, is particularly the politicians, the policymakers, and other powerful individuals and institutions in our society. But I think the perspective that I hear, especially from the left, uh, the, the media critique from the left, is that this is a crisis, and thus journalists have to cover it differently than Bush or Obama or other past presidents. Cover a crisis differently. Do you subscribe to that at all? I mean, are there, are there things that the Post is doing differently today? Well, I think, you know, there's certainly, we're perhaps more blunt than we were in the past about- More blunt. Uh, more blunt about calling out falsehoods than we, we did in the past, mm -hmm. uh, because there's so many of them, and they're so, uh, they're so blatant. Uh, so I think that uh, we feel an obligation uh, to do that. Uh, I don't think we need to reorder the entire way that we do our, do our jobs as journalists. Uh, and, and look, we don't want to, look, uh, Steve Bannon tried to call us the opposition party. Uh, we don't see ourselves as the opposition party, and we're not inclined to uh, embrace the notions of some people who would like us to be the opposition party. We're an independent news organization. We're independent of all parties uh, and all ideologies. And so, and what our, 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 we're faithful, we try to be faithful to the facts wherever they may fall. Your famous line is that we're not at war, we're at work. Right. But if it's one side- It's gonna be on my tombstone. I think it uh, is. Apparently, yeah. That's, but if one side's at war and the other side is a pacifist, doesn't the pacifist lose? Well, that's, I guess that's the you know, way that you would frame it. It's not the way that I would frame it, uh, is that I think we just have a job to do. And I think that we have the greatest credibility when we do our jobs honestly, honorably, accurately, fairly, diligently, energetically, uh, unflinchingly, uh, and, uh, and that's what we try to do. And the public, uh, and the public can come to their own conclusions. Uh, and I think that's our role as the press. Uh, and then advocacy groups, partisans can do what they want with that. So I'm saying maybe it's an emergency, maybe it's a crisis. The idea on the other side would be to say, hey, it's been 18 months since the president took office and the Washington Post hasn't been kicked out of the briefing room. You haven't been uh, uh, you know, uh, dispatched in some way or another that maybe some of the fears that those liberal media critics had, maybe those fears were overwrought. Is there something to that? Well, first of all, the fears aren't just coming from the left. The fears That's are true. coming from the right. There are many conservatives who are very concerned about what the, the administration has said uh, regarding a free and independent press in this country. Uh, and I think there has been a long-term, there is a long-term corrosive effect on the role of a free and independent press in this country. Uh, the president has done a lot to try to undermine that role, to subvert it, uh, to uh, position us as an, as an opposition party. And uh, that's what he wants us to be perceived as. Uh, it's not what we are. Uh, but um, uh, so I do think it has a long-term corrosive effect on, uh, on the role of a free and independent press in the society. And I think it's important to remember that there is no democracy and has never been a democracy without a free and independent press. And so I believe that a president, uh, he doesn't have to agree with us. He doesn't have to like us. He's free to criticize us as much as he wants. But I don't think that he should be engaged in uh, activities that are designed to basically subvert the very role of a free and independent press in this democracy. The most recent quote that comes to mind is the greatest enemy quote, that the, 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 what he calls fake news is America's greatest enemy. When he says something like that that's so hateful, do you ever pick up the phone? Do you ever call the White House? Do you ever speak to him or one of his aides? Are there ever any back channels like that? Uh, I don't call to say, listen, Mr. President, uh, <laughs> I'm really upset over what you said Pull today. It, Mr. President. Uh, in fact, if I made such a call, I don't think anything could make him happier. Uh, and so, you know, my view is that, look, he can say these things. I don't like them. Uh, I think they're corrosive. I don't think that they're appropriate, and they're not true. Uh, but my job and our job is to continue to do our jobs, uh, to do our work uh, as we've traditionally done it, and to do what I just said, is to do it honestly, honorably, accurately, fairly, unflinchingly, 
That's what we're going to do, regardless of what the president has to say about us. Or, or any president in and the my, future, for that matter. Or any president in the future. Look, I mean, people think that we had this incredibly, this, this popular misconception that we had some incredibly warm relationship with the Obama administration. It doesn't happen to be true. I think our last, uh, is the Washington Post's last interview with the Obama administration was in the second year that he was in office. For the last two years that he was in office, we asked for interviews repeatedly, particularly in the last year that he was in office. We were denied and denied and died, as he gave interviews to all sorts of other media outlets that he viewed, uh, he, 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 he thought would be more favorable to him. Uh, and um, uh, because I think that people expected, he expected, and his, his aides expected, that we would ask tough questions. And that's our job, is to ask tough questions regardless of who's in the White House. With the daily news cycle feeling as intense and overwhelming as it does, are you thinking differently about what the front page should look like or what the home page should look like? Is there such a thing as too much Trump coverage, for example? Well, there probably is such, things, is, is such a thing as too much Trump <laughs> coverage. Uh, but um, look, he's, he's setting the agenda in so many different ways uh, in this country, for sure, uh, and actually ar around the world. And we cannot look away uh, when a person who is almost certainly the most powerful person on Earth is shaping the agenda domestically and internationally. Uh, we have to cover that. We have to cover it a lot. Uh, we have to cover its, its, its impact uh, and why it's happening and who's influencing those policies, doing the role that, uh, of journal that journalists have done for a long time. It's, what, it's the definition of journalism. You know, why is it happening? Who is it affecting? Who's, who's influencing these decisions? That's what we do as journalists. That's what we need to continue to do. Yeah, and lately there's been some, some fantastic post coverage of the border crisis and the situation with these children are there stories you're particularly proud of in the past year and a half? Maybe stories that, that maybe didn't get enough attention or were, were overlooked, but are there stories that you're particularly, that, that stand out to you as what the Post should be doing? Oh, well, there are a lot. I mean, look, we just did, we just launched a series on uh, uh, what we call zones, essentially zones of impunity, where murders have taken place in urban centers, uh, where if, if, if someone's murdered, there's, it's highly unlikely that anyone will ever be arrested. Uh, and uh, there are huge zones within major urban centers where no arrests take, take place. Uh, and, and so people who live in those, uh, in those areas uh, recognize that there, there's a high degree of, uh, of danger uh, living there, and, and these, things aren't being, these things aren't being addressed. So we do that. It's a data-heavy project, and uh, it took a long time. We continue to work on that. Uh, we're very proud of that work. I think it'll, uh, set, it'll, it'll, it'll set off a conversation about that subject, and, um, and we're going to devote even more resources to that. So we do those kinds of projects all the time. It's a good example of agenda setting that goes well beyond just administration coverage. Oh, totally. Absolutely. Uh, what about the slogan of the paper, which is the title of our, of our session today? Democracy Dies in Darkness has been applauded, it's been criticized, uh, you know, the people have picked it apart, talked about it. What does it mean to you, the, the, the Post slogan? Well, look, first thing I would point out is that this, uh, we started trying to develop a slogan well before Donald Trump became mm -hmm. president. Uh, it wasn't a consequence, of the Trump, a consequence of the Trump presidency. The reason it happened during the Trump presidency is because we struggled with the, the motto for such a long period of time, and we had hundreds, if not thousands, of options available to Can us. Can you tell and, us a couple others? Uh, they're so, some of them are so bad, I wouldn't, they wouldn't be worth uh, repeating. Uh, and they would just subject us to mockery. So. Um, um, so, you know, look, we wanted something. We never really had anything. Uh, and, and the Post has, has been known for accountability, what we call accountability journalism, holding uh, people in office and other powerful individuals and institutions accountable as, and shining light in dark corners. Uh, during the Watergate era, there was a judge who said democracy dies in the dark. Uh, and that's a phrase that uh, Bob Woodward has used many times in his, his talks uh, over the years. Uh, and it's one that stuck with us. Uh, we were a little hesitant to have dyes and darkness in our motto uh, <laughs> for obvious reasons. We tried light, uh, but it made it sound like we were either too uh, uh, self-adulatory mm. or that we were uh, a cult. Um, so <laughs> it just didn't sound right. And so we ended up with uh, democracy dyes in darkness. Are you glass half full or glass half empty about our democracy today? Uh, 
I would say glass half full. Uh, I try to be an optimist about these things. I recognize that over, over many years, over, over the history of this country, we've gone through very difficult times, uh, far worse than we are experiencing today. I mean, after all, we had a civil war. We had slavery in this country. Uh, we have had, uh, we had the McCarthy era. Uh, you know, even the First Amendment has been under siege. It was under siege and, uh, during uh, the early on under John Adams with the you know, Sedition Act and then under Woodrow Wilson with the uh, Espionage Act. And, and so uh, it's, always been under, it's always been under siege. Uh, you know, the Bill of Rights was not actually celebrated until 150 years afterwards. On the centennial of the Constitution, the nation celebrated. On the centennial of the Declaration of Independence, the nation celebrated. There was no celebration for the Bill of Rights on the centennial of, of what came to be called the Bill of Rights at a later date. It was only during FDR that we celebrated the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment and that the Supreme Court, in a full-throated way, really embraced, uh, embraced the First Amendment. Hmm. So you look around, you don't see as many of the dark clouds as some others do, perhaps. Oh, well, you know, I see plenty of dark clouds, but I, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, I, I think I see clearly the dark clouds, uh, <laughs> but I recognize that, you know, clouds can move on, and, uh, and I, look, we're under a lot of pressure. Uh, it's something we're going to have to deal with. I think that we need, uh, we need courage in our profession. Uh, to deal with that. You know, Anthony Lewis, when he, w he wrote a book on the First Amendment, uh, Freedom for the Speech We Hate, he said, you know, that the press has been given tremendous uh, freedom uh, by, the, by the Supreme Court. It owes society courage, uh, and I very much believe that, and that's what we need to exhibit these days. Where would you like to see more courage? Uh, everywhere, uh, actually. Uh, you know, I worry that uh, the press sometimes uh, pulls back out of fear out of feeling of fear. It could be fear about the administration these days, but also fear of, um, of lawsuits, uh, libel suits and things like that. There certainly uh, people these days seem more prone to threatening those kinds of suits because they know that media organizations, for the most part, particularly local ones, are in a weakened financial state. Mm -hmm. uh, they fear repercussions from advertisers. Uh, they fear repercussions from readers for just for telling the truth. Um, and, uh, and so I think in, in, good, in large segments of the press, uh, there is uh, this sort of a somewhat of an atmosphere of fear that we might do something uh, that would cause people to get upset, to cancel subscriptions, to cancel advertising, what have you. Uh, and when you're an industry that's in a weakened financial state, you're more likely to be concerned about that. Mm. Uh, I think the public is looking, for, um, is looking for a press that stands for something. Uh, that stands for telling the truth. We'll, we'll do it uh, regardless of the, of the pressures uh, and, um, and that people will support that. And we see that in our own, in our own business is that's why our subscriptions have grown so much is that people are supporting what we do. They believe in it. They see us as standing for something and they wanna, they wanna support that. Now, Glenn Beck recently walked out on me on live TV when I, I tried that. to ask about media business questions. I tried to ask about his company so I hope I can I'm ask not walking about your out business. On you. I'm not walking out on you. Let me ask about your business. I'm not afraid of you. You know, you referenced the subscriptions, uh, and I, I wonder if you can give us the, the most up-to-date sense of, uh, of, of what that business outlook looks like. Uh, is the post profitable? Uh, is it meeting its, its profit targets that Jeff Bezos sets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are profitable. And uh, two years ago, we had the first profitable year in 10 years. Uh, and then last year, we had a very uh, successful year, so we were profitable. Uh, we're investing those profits in our business. We continue to grow. We've added staff. We're up to, you know, we're heading toward like about 850 people in our newsroom when we were somewhere around 600 uh, before. Um, and we're expanding our space. And this year, we're profitable as well. So uh, we're feeling really good about that. Jeff uh, invested both financial and intellectual capital in our, in our business, and both are incredibly important. It's not just a matter of financial capital. The intellectual capital he brought is hugely valuable. Uh, and perhaps even more valuable. So, um, uh, and so, but now we're actually earning our way, and that's what we want to be. We want to be a sustainable business, and his objective and our objective collectively is to create a sustainable business model for the Washington Post. What do you have to do next, then, to get there? Uh, we have to just continue to grow. I mean, we have to see subscriptions continue to grow. We have to expand sort of our portfolio of offerings for readers. Uh, readers who came to us, let's say, because of interest in what's happening with this administration. Uh, whenever this administration is, uh, uh, is, is gone, whether it's 
two and a half years or whether it's six and a half years, uh, we want to retain those readers. And so we have to show them that we're about more than just coverage of the Trump administration. And we are doing that. And there's always so much curiosity about Bezos and what he brings. You mentioned intellectual capital. What does, what does he bring on that front? What insights has he brought that have been key? Well, there are a lot, and you know, so it would take a long time. But uh, I mean, starting at the beginning, the most fundamental one is that we needed to change our strategy as a, as a, as a company. Uh, prior to his acquisition, our strategy had been, as they put it at the time, for and about Washington. Right. Even though we were in Washington, even though we were covering politics, fundamentally, we were a regional newspaper. And Jeff immediately said, I don't think that's the right strategy for you. You have the opportunity uh, to, to, to be national. And he said, look, this industry has, taken, has suffered a lot of pain because of the internet. But the, the internet also offers a lot of gifts. And the primary gift that it offers is distribution, at, at wide distribution at virtually no additional cost. Mm -hmm. So here we are. We're uniquely positioned in the nation's capital with a name like the Washington Post, which can be leveraged nationally and internationally, and with a heritage and tradition of, of investigative journalism, Watergate, Pentagon Papers, things like that, uh, we don't need to go and have a retreat to go figure out who we are. We know who we are. And, um, and so uh, that's, that's who we want to be. Uh, and that allows us to, uh, to expand nationally and even internationally. And that was, I think, uh, he's, he's had a lot of other things to, to say, uh, but fundamentally, that, was, that, that changed us. Uh, and, and thank God we went down that path. And how do you address the, the constant concerns about whether he's meddling in the newsroom? These are concerns that President Trump likes to promote. Yeah, right. Well, just, they just don't happen to be true. It's one of those things on our uh, fact check, uh, the thousands of falsehoods out there. Four I Pinocchios? Mean, uh, well, absolutely. If we could give five, I would give five. Uh, but we have the limit of four. <laughs> so, Look, um, I strongly believe that if Bezos was meddling, somebody there would call me. There's no like, question. I, I do believe that it would leak out pretty quickly. There's no question, and I've said that. If, if, if he were meddling, the nature of newsrooms is that people would complain, people would leak it, people would be upset, mm -hmm. and you haven't heard anything like that. You or anybody else out there. There. And, I mean, and call me, but uh, yeah, no, I don't know of any. Yeah. It hasn't happened. I mean, Jeff doesn't want to interfere. He's talked about that uh, actually recently, and you know, he yeah. said that when he's uh, when he's 80, you know, if he if he were to interfere when he's 80, he would be he would feel ashamed of himself. And he wants us to be independent. That's what he wants. He hasn't interfered on anything about Amazon. He hasn't interfered on anything about himself personally. He hasn't interfered on any uh, other stories, even though. Uh, it's clear that our coverage has, uh, has irritated, agitated the, the president, uh, and that he has sought to, uh, I think, take vengeance on, on Jeff and his other business, which is entirely separate from the Washington Post. We're not owned by Amazon. Uh, we're, we're owned by Jeff. Should personally. you be owned by Amazon? Would it help the Post somehow? Would there be more integrations? I don't know that it would help Amazon. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, the, you know, probably somebody from Amazon who's watching us goes, God, no, uh, don't okay. do that. All right. uh, couldn't be a worse, a worse idea. Uh, you know, whatever, it has to be, whatever we do with the company, has to, we do it uh, at an arm's length, and it has to be good for both, mm. uh, both companies. The president's most recent attack against the Post was about these union negotiations that are going on with, with the guild that employs lots of, uh, lots of newsroom employees are a part of. Uh, he encouraged the staffers to go on strike because, of course, he wants the Post not to print or something. But what is going on with those negotiations? Anything you can tell us? Right. President, major supporter of the labor movement. Um, um, <laughs> so, uh, look, uh, negotiations, they have their ups and downs. Uh, they can get pretty tense. That's the nature of them. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, uh, you know, there's just a lot of tension and, um, and brinksmanship and, and those kinds of things. Right. I'm absolutely confident that, that uh, those issues are going to be resolved. And I think what's important to remember is that it's not, uh, it doesn't come down to uh, Jeff's personal resources. It comes down to the resources of the Washington Post. As I said before, the objective here is to make sure that the Washington Post is a sustainable business over the long run. We're not a charity. We don't want to be treated by like a charity. We don't want to be a charity case. Uh, if, if we were, and if Jeff were to get tired of this charity, we would be in deep trouble. Uh, and so the objective is to make sure that uh, over the long run, we are a self-sustaining business. Uh, that's what we need in, in, in the world of journalism. Uh, and we need it for the Post, and we need it for organizations throughout this country, particularly at the local level, where the crisis in journalism is the greatest. 
You mentioned 850 newsroom staffers. That's a round the number? It's a round number, yeah. At the New York Times, they'll tell you they Jeff have... Jeff wants to take it to 900, 950. I'm, right. I'm not going to object. Because the New York Times would say they have, you know, 1,200 or something like More that. More than that. More. How do you pick your spots? How do you think about that as someone with, with a smaller staff? How do you try to differentiate and compete? Yeah, well, you know, when I came to the Post, even before Jeff acquired, I came to the Post before uh, Jeff acquired, it was owned uh, by the Washington Post Company, which, for which the controlling owner was the Graham family. Um, and, you know, I said to the staff then, you know, that New York Times can be the U.S. Army and we're going to be special forces. Uh, so uh, we can still win uh, the war. We just have to, we absolutely have to pick our shots. Uh, we have more resources today than we had then, substantially more resources, uh, but I still think we have to pick our shots. And I think it's important to remember that in this era of the Internet, um, we, don't we as the Post don't necessarily need to be comprehensive in all areas. Mm. Uh, certainly in the coverage of politics and policy and government, we want to be comprehensive in, in those areas. In other areas, I think that we can, uh, you can find, look, you can find comprehensiveness on the Internet more comprehensiveness than you will find with any individual uh, news source. So we will never be able to replicate that degree of comprehensiveness. So what we need to provide is distinctiveness. Uh, cover a lot of things and have the, the best people, the best reporters that, that reader, re, readers are drawn to those reporters. I was work. just talking to one of your reporters, Dave Weigel, who has been covering uh, liberal uh, politics lately, has been covering these progressive challengers. Of course, the biggest story of the day in New York uh, is, is the defeat of Joe Crowley. Uh, and, you know, he was on to that early. He was, he was covering that, that race really early. Um, that's an interesting example of, you know, knowing when to let a reporter go out and roam and giving them the space to go find stories that, frankly, the national media was not covering. Uh, that, that race was not getting national attention. So how do you do that? How do you how do you juggle that? Look, we we depend very much on the on the judgment uh, and of our reporters, the reporters who have good antenna, who have great experience, as Dave Weigel does. Uh, he's actually going to be producing our campaign newsletter, uh, and as we head toward the the midterms, uh, Dave has deep experience, great knowledge. He looks for uh, he looks for interesting races uh, to pay attention to. He knows a lot more about it than I do. I sit in the office all day long. What do I know? Uh, I know what Dave what Dave is going to tell me, and what our, all our other reporters are going to tell me. They're the ones who are out there talking to sources. They're the ones who are uh, taking the measure of uh, the political landscape. Yeah, and you mentioned pressure. The reporters are under. Certainly there's a lot of pressure that White House reporters feel, reporters feel covering the administration, but it has trickled out beyond there, hasn't it? It's trickled out into uh, covering agencies, covering local races, where we see cries of fake news and uh, you know, complaints like that. What are you telling your reporters these days about how to handle the pressure? Uh, well, I'm not really having sort of just sort of uh, counseling sessions with the reporters. They, no. they generally can handle things pretty well themselves. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure where I would counsel them. They would need, they, they would benefit from that. Uh, so um, they, um, look, we just, uh, it's true that at the local level, at state level, uh, even prior to the Trump administration, but especially after the Trump administration, uh, people have been more aggressive with regard to the press. Uh, they're saying no, they're denying access to public, public records, they're uh, basically uh, challenging us to file a lawsuit, they know that that's expensive mm -hmm. to obtain this information, they're arguing uh, privacy, making privacy arguments and every argument that they can make in order not to provide information. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, excluding reporters from meetings and what have you. Uh, and local, local news organizations, they have far fewer resources to combat this than, than we do. Uh, we have a, uh, a great legal team. We have outside legal resources that we can deploy in circumstances like this, and, uh, and we do deploy them. I mean, look, we, when we were covering Ferguson, our reporter got, one of our reporters, Wes Lowry, actually got arrested, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he was going to be charged. And, you know, we fought back very aggressively, and he was not charged. So um, uh, it took a while to get to that point, but uh, he didn't do anything other than try to cover what was happening there. And speaking of the, the legal threats and legal process, the last time we spoke, uh, it, was, it was in the fall, we were talking about the possibility of, of leak prosecutions and, and things like that. And I was struck by how seriously you were taking that. I, I, I think I was making the argument that, hey, you know, it's been a few months, they haven't prosecuted anybody, uh, there's no sign that, that, that it looks like uh, Trump is all talk and no action when it comes to leaks. 
Well, now we have started to see leaked prosecutions. Uh, there's been the recent story involving um, Ali Watkins of the New York Times and James Wolfe. Although he's not being charged with leaking, he's being charged of, of lying to the FBI. What do you see right now with regards to leaked prosecutions? Is there a lot going on in the, in the, in the darkness that we don't know in terms of leaks being investigated? Uh, well, if it's in the darkness, I'm not sure I entirely know. Uh, I mean, my, my sense is that, uh, is that the Justice Department and the administration generally, the White House and the occupant of the White House, dearly would like there to be an aggressive leak prosecution of a journalist. He would like a scalp. Uh, and, uh, and he said that, you know, in his conversations with James Comey, he talked about wanting to put uh, journalists in jail. And uh, he certainly has not expressed any concerns about uh, the repression of a free and independent press in other countries, uh, whether it's Turkey or Hungary or Russia or China or the Philippines or any of these other places where uh, these governments, authoritarian governments, have, have put journalists in jail. And uh, he hasn't expressed any, they haven't expressed any concerns whatsoever. And so I think that uh, he probably wants uh, a, a, a successful leak investigation. And he wouldn't mind going after not just the source of the leak, but he like going after the journalist. I hope that doesn't happen. I don't think it should happen. Uh, I think it would be a very dangerous course for this country to pursue. Uh, but. Uh, I'm certainly not willing to rest easy. I'm sorry that you didn't get your instant gratification on uh, uh, some, uh, some prosecution no, yet. No, no, no. I'm not um, looking for it, but I'm know. surprised that we haven't seen more of it. Well, these things take a lot of time. Uh, so these investigations take a lot of time, uh, thankfully. Uh, so um, I think we'll have to wait to see. It's all, you know, but I, your point I know is, that it seems longer, but it's only, we've only been, I know it seems longer, but we've only had about a year and a half of this administration. So. <laughs> So and, and your point is, we're you still, can't, we're can't rest we're, easy we're about still, it. We definitely cannot rest What easy. precautions are taken? What precautions do, you, do your reporters take with regards to sources? Uh, well, I'm not ready to uh, lay them all out for you. Uh, but, um, you know, obviously we use a lot of encrypted communications. We have uh, vehicles on our website for people to submit information to us. Uh, none of those is fail-safe, as, uh, as we know and as we are learning every day. Uh, in-person uh, conversations are probably the most successful uh, ones. And more and more, uh, we're not relying on technology. Uh, we're relying on human interaction. Are there other legal threats or issues that you see? I mean, the president campaigned on the idea of loosening the libel laws. We haven't seen action on that, but he talked about it. Are there other threats with that regard? Uh, well, he can't loosen the libel laws, okay? So the libel laws are at a state level. So he talked about loosening the libel laws and he has no authority to do anything there. Uh, and we can be grateful for that. So, um, uh, you know, I mean, I think the, the primary uh, tool that he's using is, a, is the bullet pulpit that he has uh, that's an effort to discredit the press as an independent arbiter of fact. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to position us as an opposition party uh, so that people won't believe anything that we report. So what do we do, the collective we, to rebuild trust? I know the obvious answers are about being careful and not screwing up and, and being, but do you think there needs to be a more concerted campaign? Does there need to be more cooperation among news outlets? I mean, do we need to think bigger with regards to trying to rebuild what's been tear, torn down? Well, I mean, I think that we need to do several things, and none of them is, a, is by any means is a complete answer to this. Yeah. Uh, and collectively, they're probably not a complete answer. I think we need to be more transparent. I think we need to talk more about who we are, who works on our staff. You know, this, uh, we need to combat this, uh, this uh, misconception that everybody who works in the newsrooms of major news organizations is somehow from a coastal elite. That's not, that's not true. Uh, you know, we have people who have evangelical backgrounds, we have who've gone to evangelical colleges, we have people who have been in the military, who've been through combat, uh, we have people who've grown up on, uh, in rural areas and, and, worked, and their families own farms. We have people from a lot of different backgrounds. So we, I think we need to talk more about who we are, and we're trying to do that. We need to talk more about how our, we do our work. We need to expose more of it. We need to provide more original documents, more video, uh, more... Uh, audio, everything, anything that we can do that's actually supportive, that's supportive of our work. And so those are some of the things that I think that we, that we should do. I also think that we as an industry need to talk more about who we help. I mean, over decades, mm. you know, it's like, you know, this idea of sort of uh, the forgotten people of America. 
journalists, perhaps more than any other profession, has been paying attention to the forgotten people of America. And I think that we, uh, we need to remind people of that. You know, self and healthy, health and safety concerns around, around the country, mm. uh, people who have been treated unjustly by the legal system, all of that. I mean, journalists have been writing about that, ordinary people who have suffered because of abuses of power. Uh, and we have so many cases, and I wish we would find a way to highlight those cases, mm. uh, to highlight the people who have, been, who have been helped by the work of journalists, because there are so many of them. Including loyal supporters of President Trump. Oh, absolutely. That, that benefit from journalism, and I think that might be part of the answer to this, this challenge of reaching and convincing Trump supporters that we are not the enemy. Uh, it's getting harder, in my, my perception, it's getting harder every day to reach some of the folks that are the most convinced that we're the enemy. Uh, showing them the value, showing them the work we and do. And I think that's what we need to do. We just don't, we, you know, people have taken the press for granted, the work that the press does for granted. They easily forget, they remember all of our worst mistakes. Uh, and we are, <laughs> we, we are not a perfect profession. We have many flaws. We're flawed because we're human, uh, just like any people in any other profession. Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, but we also do a lot of good. And I think that we need to highlight that good. We, we can't take it for granted, and we need to make sure that the public doesn't take it for granted either. I'd love to take questions from our audience, but first, this, I'm not joking about this. During our session, Justice Kennedy announced he's retiring. Do you need to call the newsroom? Uh, I think they can handle it w uh, without me, but I'll check I thought I, I thought I genuinely thought I need to pause for a minute, make sure you're good. Obviously, the Washington Post breaking news alert's already out, and we'll see what it means. Let's see about questions from the audience. Uh, and we have microphones in the room, so we're going to bring microphones to you. Let's start over here. Uh, we also have a hand over here we can bring a microphone to. You want to start right here in the... I want to ask about um, the kind of journalism on TV that I, at least I grew up with, uh, CBS, where they would do white papers. Uh, video white papers on different subjects like the assassinate uh, the, uh, the Warren report and mm. safe at any speed uh, regarding car safety. Um, I, th I find that on cable there's precious little of that kind of media journalism. You know, I, I, Fareed Zakaria, uh, I, 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 I think Anthony Bourdain, in terms of storytelling, will be deeply missed because I think he was an empathy machine. Mm. Um, yeah. What, what is your, what are your, both of you, what are your thoughts about the absence of this kind of journalism that allowed people to understand stories better? You see it on 60 Minutes, that's a continuing tradition, but I see a real dearth of it. Is it because the market doesn't want it or journalists don't embrace it? What? No, no, I want to hear your two. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I mean, I do, you mentioned 60 Minutes. They do this kind of work. Dateline does this kind of work. Uh, you know, there are others uh, on uh, PBS Frontline does this kind of work. So I'm not sure that it's, it's gone into quite the oblivion that you've described. Uh, there's also, I think, one thing that you need to look at is the, the rise of documentaries, uh, documentary film, which I think is an ascendant form uh, and really interesting. Uh, and so a lot of what used to be done on television is now being done through documentaries that can appear as a, theatri as a, as a film in a theater or can actually be on, uh, on Netflix or on Amazon Prime or on any of these other, uh, other out venues. So I think that's where this is going, is more into documentary films. Do you, do you think that it's a big audience opportunity, though? Uh, it can be, uh, yeah. And I think that's why doc documentaries seem to be, it's not like people are making a lot of money at documentaries, but but they do seem to be a thriving form, and I think that people are, that vacuum is being filled. I would just add about, I, you, know, you said something earlier, Marty, about uh, comprehensiveness on the internet, how everything is available somewhere online. I think it's one of these best of times, worst of times situations, where there's more great journalism than ever being produced all around the world, and it's more accessible than ever, but it's more incumbent on us to go and find it. It's more incumbent on individuals to go and find it, to seek it out, as opposed to things being pushed to you through broadcast television, three channels, you're gonna watch whatever's on, you have to go and pull it. And uh, that means going out and getting a Washington Post subscription and going out and finding a Netflix documentary that's really challenging and interesting. 
but it's not as easy, maybe, as it used to be. Right. Um, right. Well, if as you, media has been fragmented. Sure. Uh, I mean, there are, there are ways to push it out. You mentioned our alerts. Obviously, people don't have to go find that story. Right. That story is coming. That's a good to them. example of pushing. And yeah. we have newsletters, and uh, you sign up for those news as do others. Sign up for those newsletters, and they will push out stories to you, so you don't have to keep going directly to the website. You can get a newsletter, and those have become incredibly popular and major drivers of traffic on our site and others. Mm. More questions here, right here in the front row, and then we'll go over here. Uh, thank you. Some news organizations choose to inject a point of view into their reporting and or engage in what might be described as advocacy journalism. And I'm wondering, is that consistent? Can that be consistent with the role or duty you described for the press as an independent arbiter of fact? Right. Well, there are a lot of different kinds of journalism. There's always, throughout history, there's been advocacy journalism. In fact, if you look at the history of the press in the United States, it started as advocacy journalism, you know, with pamphlets and things like that. Uh, so uh, that continues to this day. You know, some of it depends on how you define sort of point of view and bias and what have you. Uh, if you insert any analysis and context into a piece, then some people will say that's, that's bias. Um, I think we need that. I think we need to put things into context and, and we need some level of analysis and then we need those separate analysis pieces that are properly labeled as such. So, um, look, I mean, every, uh, I mean, it was Robert Jackson, the Supreme Court Justice in 1947 said, every person needs to be uh, his own watchman for the truth and uh, because the, the, our forefathers didn't uh, depend on any government to tell them what's true and what's false. And uh, we need to be sophisticated consumers of information and, and look at a, a, wide range of, a wide range of sources. You know, I'd be happy if you made the Washington Post your only source, but uh, I, in all honesty, I don't think it should be. There should be a variety of sources, and there's a, there's a burden on the consumer as well to be a sophisticated consumer of information and make, make their own judgments. It's striking how in New York, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez's campaign was fueled partly by left-wing opinion outlets, uh, The Intercept, The Young Turks, et cetera. They helped put her on the map nationally and, and brought her candidacy to the fore. I would call those opinion outlets or opinion journalists. There's well, not room for those, but then you also, I think, need the Dave Weigels to report on what's going on on the ground and, and have a more objective view. That's right, well, The Intercept is more on the news side, uh, but with coming from a particular point of view. Point of view. Yeah. Uh, right here is a question in the third row. So a lot of this discussion has been about coverage of news within the United States, but of course that's not the only thing the Washington Post does, it's not the only thing that journalists do. We need to understand the world as well. Many foreign bureaus have shut down over the past 20 years, especially over the last 10, mm -hmm. um, including the Boston Globe's bureaus, thankfully not so much the Washington Post. Um, what have you found and what do you suggest for smaller newspapers that want to cover international news seriously in terms of you know, how best to do it given lim limited resources? And do you see the work of the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists on the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers to be a good model for cooperation going forward. Right. Well, uh, yeah, it's true. When I was at the Boston Globe and we were going through cutbacks, and while I was there, I had to cut our staff by 40% over the course of my time there. Uh, I had to make the decision to eliminate the foreign bureaus so that we could maintain our local, our local coverage. Uh, at the Washington Post, they did scale back, but now we're in a position of actually expanding our foreign bureaus. So two years ago, we added two foreign bureaus. We added three this year. Uh, I would hope that we would continue on that, that path. Uh, we also added additional uh, foreign staff uh, based in, in Washington. For local news organizations, uh, they have to be very selective about what they do. Obviously, to maintain foreign correspondence is very, very expensive. Uh, and, and so, but it's clear that foreign news affects communities all over this country. And so they need to find the stories that are relevant to their to their, the citizens of their country, their communities and the people who live in their communities. And then ideally try to allocate resources for someone to go overseas and help develop and develop that story. As far as uh, the International Consortium of Journalists, uh, that they're doing great work. They obviously did great work on the, on the Panama Papers. Uh, and I would encourage all those, those kinds of collaborations. Uh, they're probably not that relevant for a smaller local a smaller local newspaper. Maybe they will be someday, but right now, probably not. 
We have some questions in the back. If we can uh, get a mic over here. And I saw a hand in the back over there as well. We'll bring a mic to you. Hi, I'm just wondering if there's any interest in the Washington Post being published in other languages like Arabic where there is a lack of real objective journalism. Uh, we are interested. Uh, it's something that we talk about a lot. Um, I think to reach a foreign audience, um, you don't just translate. You have to think more in terms of, of first of all, what's your story selection? Uh, how are those stories written? Because the way that journalism is written and consumed in other countries is actually different uh, from how it is written and consumed in this country. Uh, so we have, we have talked about that uh, with a particular interest in Spanish, obvious, for obvious reasons. But um, uh, we're not at the point of doing it. Uh, we'll, we, we're still talking about it. Hmm. Here in the back. Can I ask you to, can I press you a little bit on the Watkins-Wolf case and the, the impact, the contours, uh, uh, Im implications going forward? Uh, look, we're, we're concerned anytime the Justice Department de decides to subpoena a reporter's records. Uh, we, you know, there are standards that the Justice Department is supposed to follow under a set of guidelines that was, that's, that's long been established and then was somewhat revised during the Obama administration and which the, this administration has not yet repudiated. Uh, so um, we certainly don't see in that case that there was any sort of imminent, we can't tell that, I can't see that there was any imminent danger to an ongoing investigation or that there was any imminent danger and, and grave danger to national security uh, that required them to do that. Uh, so I'm, I am concerned about that. Now obviously there's some issues at the journalistic side of things there too uh, and I probably, don't really want to go in there because I don't know all of the facts. Uh, that's something that the New York Times is just going to have to deal with. What if I worked for you and I was having a romantic relationship with a source? Yeah, we would tell you what not to you, do that. Um, would, so I would be moved off to a different beat, I presume? Uh, you, you that's probably, one of the issues in the You almost Wolf certainly case. would not remain on the beat where you, uh, uh, that you're covering at that moment. You know, it's complicated. In this case, they say he wasn't a source for her, but it's very murky. The general subject area, we, would, we wouldn't want you, I can say that we would not want you anywhere near that subject area. That's why I'm happily married. All right, uh, other questions? Uh, let's take a couple more before we go. Here's a hand in the back. I, a number of us, um, we know that journalism um, and journalists are not necessarily known for their health and well-being. They work long hours. Um, <laughs> and a, now... What do you mean? The, <laughs> The viciousness and the constant attacks. I guess I just wonder what you're doing um, to help them with their health and well-being, and what can we do for the journalists that we love to tell them, you know, to offer them support. Um, <laughs> uh, they're not all they're not all unhealthy, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Some of them, they run in the morning, they run in the evening, they go to the gym, uh, they try to eat healthy. If you've seen Bob Costa on Washington Week in Review, he's lost a tremendous amount of weight. Um, uh, he's got some special diet that I should follow, but um, uh, you know, they're all, they're, um, on the other hand, I do think that uh, it is it's a high pressure profession, one that's, that's endured even greater pressure these days. Uh, I think the best thing that any person can do is send, if you see something that you really like, send the reporter a note that says thank you. Everybody appreciates a thank you. And uh, fortunately, I've received a lot over the last couple, several years. And uh, I actually post them on my, uh, on my wall. I have a glass, glass wall in my office and I you know, make them outward facing so that people on the staff can, can see them. And uh, it's, been, it's been very gratifying to get those kinds of notes from, from readers. Now the readers who have other things to say, I have this little uh, trash bin that's very close by. <laughs> I read them, I take them to heart, uh, and uh, if somebody's civil and provides a name, uh, I often respond, so. How real is news fatigue for, for your staff right now? Uh, I think that's a real issue. I mean, I just think that the, le the pace at which people wor are working is, is just, it's immense, it's just, it's very intense. Uh, and, uh, you know, six o'clock in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, the president's up, you know, he's tweeting. Uh, He's about to go to bed, uh, you know, he isn't nearly sleepy enough, he's still tweeting. Uh, he, you know, uh, so we're having to respond to that because, and people would say, well, ignore that. I don't know that you can ignore that. That's kind of a direct window into his 
mind. Uh, right. And I think that we, uh, and, and given that those tweets actually find their way, they end up being expressed in actual policy. Right. I think we need to pay, we need to pay attention to those sorts of things. So um, it's been a, um, uh, uh, high energy administration Ooh, in that way. Good term. So, um, high energy. And so um, it's it's tested. You know, our staff they have to be up early and go to sleep late, and they're working at all hours. And and you never know what subject's going to come along. So it's not like you sort of know what the agenda for the day is going to be. Uh, it could be something that you never anticipated. It's like where did that come from? <laughs> and uh, and we have to cover it. On the bright side. We'll get to tell our grandkids about this someday. Mm -hmm. I'm covering this someday. Let's see if we can fit in two more questions. Uh, one over here, uh, right by where you're with the mic. Sure. Thank you. Um, you spoke about the need for the Washington Post to be profit making. And I wonder about um, the chasing of dollars for smaller organizations um, or more extreme journalist sources. And is the Chase for dollars a threat to objectivity, meaning are smaller organizations or more extreme organizations in their need for dollars less objective, more biased, et cetera, just to cater to their audience? You know, I don't know that we can generalize about that. And it's clear that there's some sort of new so-called media outlets that have been created solely for the purpose of exploiting uh, Facebook, uh, Google, other social media outlets, and making money from advertising that way. Uh, I don't think that uh, we can say that um, it has corrupted the, the profession generally in, in any way. And these days, actually, since the advertising model on the digital advertising model is so broken, uh, we make less and less money at it. The rates keep going down. Uh, news organizations have really had to shift uh, uh, fundamentally toward a subscription model, uh, and I think that's a good. I think that's actually a good trend for most of the for the industry. And final question, uh, right here in the uh, at the end of the row. No pressure. Final question. So, so you mentioned uh, that there's a big increase in falsehoods, and one of the issues I see is that you have to cover them but the repudiation or the clarification either is late in the article or in a different fact-checking. And that's a problem because as falsehoods are repeated over and over again, uh, it's a way to make them an effective belief for many people. Right, well, um, we have, uh, I would say that over time, we have moved up those, uh, uh, we are stating directly in a headline that something is false, stating it in the lead that it's false, uh, adding more context more quickly in, in stories, Obviously, we've added resources to our fact-checking operation, which is quite active. Um, and uh, there's a whole database of sources out there. So I understand the, I understand the concern. Um, we can't not cover what the President of the United States is saying, in my view. Uh, we can put it in proper context. We can fact-check it. We can do it both within the story, and we can do it within a fact-checking con context as, with a fact-checking story as well. Uh, and so that's sort of the, that's the approach we're taking. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I don't, you know, I, I think that people have been able, it's been largely effective. Uh, obviously, we can always do better, and we keep looking, we keep reevaluating that. What are we going to talk about after Trump? <laughs> uh, we, you know, somehow we talked about things before he arrived, and I'm sure we'll talk about things after he. Uh, Marty Baron, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.